vow of poverty will make you better in the eyes of, of the Lord. He's not saying, you know, if you want to be closer to God, be poor. He's not saying that. And you remember the New Testament writers consistently, they assume that God chooses those who are saved apart from any merit, any qualifications on the part of those chosen. And salvation is offered to anyone on the basis of anything that God sees or foresees in that person. No merit, no qualifications. So salvation is only by God's grace. You receive salvation, faith alone, and by God's grace. And God doesn't choose the rich man to get his money for the kingdom. God doesn't choose the poor man because of his poverty. God doesn't choose those whom he foresees will one day trust in him. You know why? Because salvation, salvation would, that would make salvation depend on something that originates in fallen men. If God just looked at someone and said, okay, I will choose you based on what you're going to become, God won't be sovereign. God's choice is completely based on his grace and purpose. And throughout the Bible, if you look at throughout the Bible, uh, some rich men definitely are chosen by God. Remember Abraham in Genesis chapter 3. And Abraham was a very wealthy man, extremely wealthy, and probably wealthy beyond, vastly beyond other men of his own time. In Genesis 13, verse 2, Abraham was very, it says, Abraham was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. He was very rich. God had prospered him, and God chose him. And not only chose him, to be the father of a nation, but God chose him. Not only he chose him, but he chose him to become, to be the father of a nation, Israel. And you remember Job, Job, that very, very unique man, very unique and special man, and he, he was a godly man, and godly in the sense that few other men would be godly. In fact, he was so godly that God literally turned Satan, Satan loose on him to test him. He was so wealthy in Job chapter 1 verse 3, it says he had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, a very great household, so that this man was the greatest or the wealthiest guy of all the men of the East the wealthiest guy in the world. And you could say now, he would, he would probably, he would have been the top of, of the list in the latest issue of Forbes magazine today, if you look at Job. And remember Joseph of, of Arimathea, he was a rich man, a prosperous rich man, which he was so rich enough to provide a garden tomb for the burial of our Lord Savior Jesus Christ. And we bless God that rich man was redeemed. And then we, 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 we had Levi, later who became known as Matthew, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. And he was the, the tax collector, and all tax collectors were loaded because the whole profession was filled with corruption. And Matthew was wealthy. He was not a poor man. So in the early church, they were rich in the early church. And if you read um, Paul, Paul said to, first, he said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, he said to Timothy, command them to be to do good, to be, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. 
So God doesn't have any problem with rich people. So they are in God's economy, certain elect people who are rich. So, but in spite of that, so in the context of our text, the general mass of redeemed people has come from the poor, and, and there is no doubt that God has special attention, special affection for those, for those, for those people. And if you, look, if you look at the Psalm, in Psalm 41, the psalmist wrote, Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. The Lord protects and preserves them. They are counted among the blessed in the land. He does not give them over the desire of their foes. The Lord sustains them on their sick bed and restores them from their bed of illness. In many Psalms, we see that God is the defender of the poor. He meets their need. He goes after their enemies. And if you look at the Old Testament, in the sacrificial system, poor people, poor people sometimes could not afford a lamb. So God said, if you cannot afford a lamb, bring a turtle dove or a pigeon. Every seven year was the Sabbath year of the land, and the poor had all their debts canceled at the seventh year so that the poor person will never go deeper and deeper into debt just to survive. So you see, God has a special attention, special affection for the poor. In the Jubilee year, everybody was set free in Deuteronomy, of uh, all the slaves who worked for someone else were given an opportunity to reorient their whole life. And when they harvested every year, the corners of the field were not to be harvested. They were to be off. They were to be left for, for the poor to come in and collect what remained in the corners of the field so the poor could share in the benefit of the harvest. So now in the, in the text, James says that God has chosen the poor in the eyes of the world. They are the elect. They are the ones who are, are desperate. They are the ones who cry out for resources. They are the ones who need help. And Paul wrote to, to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 21, verse 20, 26 to 29. Paul said, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world that, and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. You see, salvation is only by God's grace and through faith. So the church is made up of all common people. And if you want to know who the Corinthian church was, let me just introduce them to you. The Corinthians, and you, you have people like former fornicators, former idolaters, former adulterers, former thieves, former drinks, drunks and revilers. And that was the church. So when God chose the church, they were poor, the common, common people, just as when he chose Israel. Israel was poor and in bondage, but he chose them. By choosing them, by choosing those who, whom the world rejects and despises, God, magnify, God magnifies the riches of his grace. He magnifies the riches of his, of his grace. Why? If you look at in verse 5, he chose them. Two promises. He chose them. Why? 
to be rich in faith, and second, to be heirs of the kingdom. So when James says that God chooses the poor to be rich in faith, he means in the sphere of faith, of faith. So he chooses them. It, 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 God chooses them to be rich in faith, to be rich in the sphere of faith. And those poor people, they may never have the riches of the of the world, but the rich, but to be rich in faith. Their faith in Christ, it means has brought them to eternal riches. True riches. They have spiritual riches in Christ through God's sovereign, gracious choice which brought them to faith in him and God's choice make them heirs of the of the kingdom so what does that mean that means at the moment of salvation they come under the reign of Christ in their hearts they belong to Christ and the process everything that God has promised them this is exactly what James is saying in verse 5. They inherit the kingdom. But the remains in the future in the fullness of the, that kingdom and its blessings when Jesus returns in power and glory. And what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 34. So when James says, to become rich in faith is not only do the is not those people not only become rich in spiritual dimension through faith, but they become heirs of the kingdom, which he, which Jesus promised to them. And what is the kingdom? You're probably wondering. Okay, now he's, he's talking about. The kingdom is talking about be, to be rich in faith. And what's that? what's that? And the sphere of salvation. And what James is describing here, James is describing the result of salvation, not, not the means to it. He's describing the, the salvation. And what happens when we, when we are saved? Salvation, first salvation is by God's grace. And as soon as you have, you receive salvation, you, receive, you are in the kingdom. You are part of the kingdom of God. And you need to receive it by grace. And you receive it by grace and through faith alone. Exactly what Paul said in the book of Ephesians. So, but, but when God lavishes his grace on us, we respond by loving him. Because we sing it this morning because he first loved us. And the kingdom is, as I said, the kingdom is a sphere of salvation with all that includes, all that implies. This is the kingdom. And if you realize that we have two phrases, which in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which, is, which has promised to them that love him. Basically, James is saying the same thing. We become rich and how rich we own the kingdom, we possess the kingdom. All that God has promised to those that love him become ours. And calling someone to the kingdom is calling someone to salvation. So we belong to Christ. Everything that he has promised us, we have him through faith in him. And all eternal reward, all the blessings in time, as well as uh, we, we will, we, those things belong to us. The fullness of salvation, the, wish, with the richness of God's eternal blessing is promised to the poor who become rich in faith. And notice what he says, those who love him. So two things. You see, two things that are said to be exercised here. Two things. First, one is faith. And, and the other one is love. So basically what he's saying, he's saying is when a believer, when a person puts his faith in Christ and loves him, 
He gives evidence of having received by an inheritance the witness, the witches of the eternal kingdom of God. Exactly what he's saying. When you put your faith in Christ, you receive all the, witch, all the witches that God has promised through his son Jesus Christ. And now in verses seven, say six and seven, and, push, and now James is saying partiality is not only wrong, is not only inconsistent because you put yourself as sovereign in, in the place of God, but now he's, he's, he's telling them partiality is wrong because it aligns you with God's blasphemers. But you have dishonored the poor in verse six. And it's not the rich who are exploiting you. Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? He asks a question that required an affirmative answer. Is this not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? You know, because of greed and and selfishness in every culture and every age the wealthy tend to take advantage of those who are helplessly poor even though the rich man does not need the money he forecloses on the poor on the poor person poverty and we, we have seen that throughout the bible and to collect uh, to collect on the debt or charges exorbitant interest that the poor the poor could not never hope to repay. Or the poor, the, the rich man, he will, he will pay a pitiful wages that hardly allow uh, um, a poor man to feed his, 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 his family or while the rich man gets richer. And then you have an example of that in the, in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, in First Kings chapter 20, 21, and, and, and we have the wicked uh, Jezebel. Jezebel and hired false witnesses to cause neighbor to, and, and to, to execute him. And then she seized his property just because her mad husband wanted it for a vegetable garden. And because of this, God pronounced severe judgment on, on Hayab and, on, and, and Jezebel in First Kings chapter 21 verses 1 to 24. Because the law stipulated that Israel appoint those who judge the people righteously. God was very, very concerned about that. His righteousness, his justice, his equity. And God said to them, merchants were commanded to have full, just weights, uh, well, just, just weights and, and measures, and, and measures in Deuteronomy 25. And bribery was condemned. And the prophets often confront Israel for oppressing the poor, especially orphans and, and, and widows. And, and you remember Sodom was, was condemned because she had arrogance and abundant food and careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. In the New Testament, Paul exhorts in, in the Colossians, he, he said to the master, grant you to your slave justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. So here, James' point is that you give preferential treatment to the rich man who oppresses the poor, you are aligning yourself with God's enemies. You are aligning yourself with God's blasphemers. And perhaps some believers in the church, some believers were, they were calculating that excessive flattery of rich people who visit the assembly might gain favor for them. If so, James says, you know what, their calculations are far off. Don't think you, the rich will give you some advantages because you give them some favor. 
And then the word, some translations, you have the word draw or you have the word uh, drag. And literally the, the word means to drag. It means to force you. It's the idea of you know, dragging you into court to exploit you by some injustice, some iniquity. And worse than that, the blaspheme, the worthy name by which you have called. You, and what is the worthy, worthy name? The worthy name of Jesus. They slandered Jesus. They slandered the name of Jesus Christ. And wealthy Christ rejecting Jews, no doubt, in that community, rejecting Jesus as their Messiah, were blaspheming the name of Jesus, dragging these people in the, into court, harassing them. Harassing them, and this is worthy name by which you are called. And that little phrase by which you are called in some translation by you to by which to you belong in, in the NIV you have to whom you belong speaks of personal relationship. You belong to him. And this was by the way, and, and then why uh, James used that. He used that because first by their baptism, they, they have received the name of Christ when they were baptized. Those believers who were baptized, they were first called by the name of Jesus. They took on the name of Jesus, the, the name Christian. That means Christ's own. So you are called Christian, but based the Jews, the, the, the which they, they were blaspheming that name, the, the very name that you, you have. So James reminds them that at their baptism, they took on the worthy name of Jesus Christ and the rich people who oppresses them, who, and the, 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 who oppress them, not the poor people. So he reminds them that they belong to Christ and they are not to practice, practice uh, partiality. Let me conclude with that. Love for Orders impartiality demonstrates true salvation, the life of God at work in us, in the soul of a believer. If you want to know if this person is, is a Christian, is true Christian, if he, if he has the true faith, the living faith that James is talking about, he needs to test himself on partiality. And may the Lord save us from the sin of favoritism and make our church a church where everybody is welcome, everybody is beloved. For everyone, for who they are, they are in Christ. May we have his love toward all those who are around us. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you for your word and thank you for James and thank you for for his writing and Lord I pray that you help us and to not fall into sin of favoritism and I pray that you will protect us and, and let us always remember that you are the one who saves, who are the one who chooses and not to put ourselves and to judge because otherwise we will, we will sin against you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.